In Peebles, Ohio, the world's largest serpent effigy, built in the distant past by indigenous peoples, wends its way across a plateau near the edge of an ancient crater. The great serpent appears to have an egg in its mouth. Great horned and feathered serpents, or underwater panthers, Uctena, Kichi Athusos, Mishe Pashu, Michiganobek, Gidiskog, and other similar forces of the watery underworld have been depicted by indigenous cultures in what's now North America across their histories. These sometimes dragon-like, occasionally scaled, sometimes furry forms can be found among many cultures around the globe. And lake monster legends persist today in tales of Nessie of Loch Ness, our own champ in Lake Champlain, and more. We're discovering some of the indigenous peoples of what's now New England may have also built serpent effigies that wend their way across the landscape, some hiding in plain sight as old stone walls. I'm author and researcher Mike Luoma, looking into our ancient stone mysteries of New England and sharing what I find in my videos, writing, and Facebook group. My work follows in the footsteps of several investigators who have been at this much longer than I've been. Researcher Tim McSweeney of the Waking Up on Turtle Island blog and Celebrating the Ceremonial Stone Landscapes of Turtle Island Facebook group opened my eyes to the possibility of effigy work in our stone rows through his photo illustrations, where he adds antlers and eyes, including some on stonework I'd found. Then my own experiences kicked in. Years as an artist and doing layout and graphic design work. And earlier time as a mason tender, helping build with brick and block. I was seeing repeated designs in what some foresters and ecologists mistakenly labeled random or haphazard or even bad stone walls. These designs seem to correspond to elements of underwater panthers, great serpents, and their like, as depicted in indigenous works. When asked what makes something a possible indigenous serpent row, I often share this page from my notebooks, illustrating some of these designs. What these designs represent may be a matter of speculation, Yet they do exist, as you'll see, as I share some examples of what I look for in the stones. Indigenous stone rows are often fairly straight, especially those which line up with celestial events, like the winter solstice sunrise, for example. But some show zigs and zags along their length. Like this one, near Indian Brook Reservoir in Essex, Vermont. And some list a bit, leaning from side to side, in easy S-shapes. These slants and zigs and zags seem to suggest serpentine forms. Age and circumstance can also warp a stone rose path, so looking at the coursework is important too. 
By coursework, I mean the way the stones are arranged in a stone row. European-influenced stone walls are usually very regular. Two over one in coursework. A lot like bricks. Indigenous stone rows seem to have more organic and flowing coursework. And so they feature more design elements. Some feature boulders as serpent heads. I found stones arranged like my illustration the day after drawing it along a brook near Indian Brook Reservoir. Boulders often seem to represent serpent heads. Some seem to be quite large. I also find these surrounded stones, as I call them. Some researchers suggest these could be heart stones. Tim McSweeney believes they could be serpent eyes. I see them as possibly eyes or coils, perhaps eggs, and maybe all of the above. There are occasionally what appear to be fin stones atop stone rows, perhaps the fins of the great serpent along its back ridge. Or the dagger-like spikes found along the back and tail of the underwater panther. These aren't European-style coping stones. Indigenous stone rows often undulate across the landscape, 
rising and falling in arcs, like the rising coils of a lake monster rising from the depths. Don't mistake these dips and rises for a collapsing stone wall. When you look closer, you see the stone courses, the lines of stone in the stone row, go up and down with the arcs and dips in the stone row. They're designed and engineered in. Sometimes we see where undulations have been evened out. The arcs cut off and the dips filled in to level off the top of the wall, adapting and taming the old stone serpents. Lastly, on my notebook page, I noticed some stonework was quite representational. Instead of an abstract boulder head, some stonework seems to have more complex heads and other more representational zoomorphic forms. Like these near Stovermont. And these in southern Vermont. In Boston, Massachusetts, I saw a combination of the two. A bolder head on a more zoomorphic body. Repeated patterns and designs seen all around New England. I'm Mike Luoma, bringing my notebook page to life, trying to explain some of what I look for in the stones, the repeated designs I've seen around the Northeast in what appeared to be stone serpent effigy rows. Thank you for watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.